Welcome to the Sanity Project Podcast, where you can awaken your mind to clarity and success even in today's life challenges. We're here to provide insights and solutions that will help you live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Here's your host, Joanne Victoria. Hello, this is Joanne Victoria with another amazing episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. The Sanity Project Podcast is a place to discover a life of clarity, confidence, and success. And our guest today is going to do almost the same thing because that's why she's here. Our guest today is Linda Smith. Linda is the author of Unwanted, a memoir that chronicles how her life as a childhood abuse survivor and mother of a disabled son inspired her to become an advocate within the nonprofit world for people with disabilities. Uh, Linda Smith has raised almost a billion dollars for people, and she's going to talk a little bit about that. And besides being an author and a speaker and a nonprofit consultant, she's recognized as a fundraiser icon within the Las Vegas community. And if you go onto her website, which is lindaslife.com, you will see several well-known people leaving her stunning testimonials. After 38 years of leading one of the largest and well-known nonprofit profit organizations in Las Vegas, Linda decided to launch a consulting business as a way to connect donors with deserving charities while providing visionary ideas and various fundraising approaches for nonprofits. But Linda's going to talk to us about today is how to push through adversity and life struggles and find your own path to success. Now, it's always important from my point of view that our listeners know that my guests are normal people. They're not aliens. They're not gods. They're normal people that have gone through crap. And Linda is one of them. And she just has a little bit more in her crap can than most of us do. And what she's going to do is talk to you today. And I want you to take notes. If you don't take notes, listen to this again. Before she even starts, I know she's going to tell you great stuff. But let's welcome Linda Smith to the show. Hello, Linda. How are you? Well, hi. I'm wonderful. It's really interesting for me to to hear my story uh, spoken back to me. <laughs> well, Sounds pretty cool. Well, your story is important. Uh, all our stories are important, but you're the important one right now as, because you're a guest on my show. But stories are what get us wherever we need to go, and stories are what align us with other people and help us become more human in the public eye. You know, once they hear your story, they go, oh, I, you know, I, I've suffered too, maybe not as much as Linda Smith, but I've suffered and she recognizes that. So I, I like to, that's the question I like to ask my guest is, how did you get here? All right. How was your path? I mean, you're sitting where? In your home in Las Vegas, Nevada. Right. How hot is it outside? It's absolutely gorgeous. It's about 70 degrees. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So we're having some wonderful weather right now. And, and it's interesting because when you talk about, um, you know, maybe I have suffered more than others, I, I never really think of it that way. I, I, I feel like uh, some of these things, things that happen to us in life really are in, in some ways a bonus because they can set you up uh, for a future. I mean, there, there, there are instances where you can just fold up and, and, and just want to die and say, why me, why me? Um, or you can take adversity and make it be a teaching moment and say, okay, now I need to get on with life and from this adversity, I have learned so much, and I'm not going to be that pathetic poor person. I'm going to be something else. And I, and I really feel that if we can all just uh, take the reins of our, and control our own destiny, that, that, um, that you know, I, I, every one of us really can rise above uh, adversity. Well, it's a mindset. What went on in your life that was 
not the best thing for you that took you here. I know I, you know, when I opened, I talked about your memoir because you were a childhood abuse survivor and mother of a disabled son. And those two things, I'm sure it expanded, Mm -hmm. but they inspired you to become an advocate within the nonprofit world. Right. And, you know, I, I, I am not, a saint by any means at all. Like I, I wasn't just born to have these things happen to me and, and just, you know, float through life. But, uh, you know, when, when you're able to articulate some of these things that, that go wrong. So, so right away at the beginning, um, take for example, my upbringing, uh, when I was able to actually say, yeah, my father was a pervert. Uh, so I had a pervert father and, and, and that took some time being able to say that, I put it behind me early on as a child. As a matter of fact, um, he was, uh, I was age 11 the last time I saw my father. We had escaped from him to Canada, and uh, he came to Canada uh, looking for us, and because he is a bad person, he was eventually deported. And that's a long story. It's, it's, it's touched on in the book, but he was deported from Canada. So that meant I would never, ever have to come across this person again. And, you know, as a child, I think it's, it's sometimes it's easier uh, when, when, you're, uh, when you're very young to, to adapt. But we were poor. He put us in the poorhouse, basically. And, uh, you know, I, I lived in through homelessness for a while. We... Uh, it was actually the first time that I became aware of charity was through the Salvation Army um, who accepted our family uh, into, you know, into their wonderful organization. And so, you know, I, so again, it, it's something that I learned from. How do you overcome having uh, this, this backstory. And, and it's just a matter of saying, that's not me. That's not who I'm going to be. That's him. And so I'm moving forward. Um, homelessness to me was an experience. Uh, it wasn't a bad thing at the time. But here it's given me something to talk about. <laughs> so, yeah, peop- I, I guarantee there are people that are listening to this uh, podcast right now who have either experienced homelessness or very close to that themselves, maybe not carlessness, but homelessness, and or they know someone who's who's been through it. So I, I think that this is important that you tell whatever you're willing to share. I'm sure everything is in the book, which I just, which is titled Unwanted. And I hear that uh, it, uh, Unwanted, How a Mother Learned to Turn Shame, Grief, and Fear, into purpose, passion, and empowerment, which is what Linda is talking about right now. And also, it is now out in audiobook form, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes, it and is. Is that also available on your website? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So for those of you who don't want to turn the page, <laughs> uh, you can just listen with your ears and go to her website at lindaslife.com. That's lindaslife.com. L i n d a s l i f e dot com. I have to say that when you buy the book, though, there's great photos in there. <laughs> yeah, is it in the library at all? Do you think? Uh, yeah, um, in certain communities. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's up to people if they are attracted enough to what you have to say and how you turn. You know, it, it, they'll get the book. They'll get the audio book. They'll look at the photos. Yeah. It's what it mean it's what your story means to the listener that is most vital here. Well, the interesting thing also for me with with the book, um I kept uh you know, I I would have editors, publishers sort of try to pigeonhole, okay, who does this appeal to? What are you talking about childhood abuse? Are you talking about uh charity? Are you talking about the birth of your disabled child? You know, who is it that's who do you want to sort of you know, gear this towards. And, and it's such a, um, there's so much information in so many different directions that I had a hard time really pinning that down. So I, I really feel that everyone can get something out of this book. You don't have to be a parent of a child with a disability um, to, to enjoy this book. When I, when I'm doing uh, my speaking engagements and I, and my book tours and I sell the book, it's just really a well-rounded audience. Uh, so, um, 
maybe I should jump into from homelessness to being a mother of a child with a disability so as to not... Uh, well, speaking of that, tell us a little bit about Christopher. Yeah, you know, after the homelessness, I, I basically became an, an entertainer and and I had... Um, you know, taught myself how to dance and audition for a lot of uh, different projects. And I, I ended up as a uh, dancer on a nationally televised uh, Canadian uh, show. And it was as a dancer and a model and an actress that I met my uh, then husband, Glenn. He was, he was at the time the Can- Canadian entertainer of the year. This is in the late sixties. And so um, we got married and about three years later, I gave birth to Christopher. And the interesting side note on that is by then we were living in Las Vegas. We were legal residents of the United States. And um, at eight months uh, pregnant, I decided to hop on a plane and from Las Vegas and go to Toronto, where I had family there, and where my then entertainer husband was going to be appearing on the plane, I went into labor, um, but it was a junket flight. Some of your listeners might know what that is. Others might not, but a junket flight is an industry flight. And so I'm on a flight to Las Vegas, direct from, uh, from Las Vegas to Toronto in labor. And it turned out it was a medical junket, not, not by design. I just hopped on a junket flight um, uh, through a friend, actually Wayne Newton, if you may know who Wayne Newton is, was, was a good friend of ours, and he got me this flight. So there were 70 doctors, and the rest were nurses. Wow. <laughs> so, good hands. And, but the, the flight landed in Toronto, and Chris was born three hours later, and he was born with Down syndrome and um, related disabilities. And at the time, so here I was, this new emergency patient. Uh, I had just given birth. I was a stranger. I, d- I met the hospital, uh, met the doctor in the, you know, in the emergency room. And they really didn't know what to do. Uh, they knew right away that he was born with Down syndrome, uh, but they didn't tell me because I was all alone. And uh, eventually uh, the doctors came and stood at the end of the bed and told me, we have bad news. Your child is born profoundly disabled. He uh, has a condition known as Down syndrome, more commonly known as Mongolism. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what it used to be. Yeah, that's what they said, because these kids uh, resemble the Mongolian race. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and uh, But he has a heart condition, and he has respiratory problems, uh, but the good news is that he's not going to live very long. Oh, how nice. Yeah. So mm. that was my introduction to the world of people with disabilities. Or Canadian healthcare. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then the, you know, the story progresses to, um, because I was an American, a legal resident, and eventually a citizen of the United States, as was my husband, I had given birth to a child who would now be Canadian. And when we went to um, get his papers, we, we found that he was considered an undesirable alien in the oh United my. States. Not because he was born Canadian, but because he was born Canadian with Down syndrome. And the law at the time... Um, again, this is now, this is in the mid 70s. The law at the time said people exempt from entering the United States as permanent residents are number one, criminals, number two, retarded people, number three, communists, and it went on. Um, and and uh, it was shocking to hear that. And um, when we looked at the Canadian laws, you know, Canada wouldn't, wouldn't exclude people. Uh, the Canadian laws, written laws, said people exempt from entering Canada as permanent residents were number one, morons, imbeciles, and idiots. Number two, criminals. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, number one, and the whole family, by the way. And so these were laws, yeah, and no one had challenged those laws. And here we were, a young couple. We were entertainers. We traveled 
around the world, mostly in the United States and, and into Canada a few times. And I had a child that I couldn't get into the country. So it actually took me just about 18 years to get Christopher legal in the United States. And for uh, 15, 16 of those years, I basically hid him. So I, I harbored an illegal alien in the United States uh, for years. Uh, and that was my own son. Well, that's bad. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, like, it's like so many adjectives I could think of. But <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> bad. It's like really bad. Um, and those laws, by the way, uh, have the, the language has changed. Um, there was actually the Christopher Smith bill that was passed in Oklahoma City by Senator Finus Smith. Um, but the law actually still exists. If you have a child with an intellectual disability and you want to immigrate to the United States or to Canada, um, they fall into an exclusionary class of individuals still to this day. Hmm. Um, yeah, language changed, but the law still exists. So uh, it's, it's more difficult, maybe never, that uh, you can immigrate with a disabled child. So you saved your son. Saved? I know. You know what? He saved me. Uh, I, I, you know, right now you wouldn't be talking to me. I'd just be an old dancer. Uh, probably a self-absorbed one. And, and, and I think Christopher came along at a time in my life where, uh, you, know, I, you know, I was on this wonderful tra trajectory. I was married, was living this glamorous life in Las Vegas. I was an entertainer, but, you know, what, what, where does an old dancer go? Uh, you know, and, you know, it's particularly not a great actress, and um, here Chris was born, and he basically changed my life because I immediately saw, um, you know, the discrimination that existed, uh, that it still exists to a large degree for, for people, for special people like my son. And remember, when he was born, I was told to throw him away uh, at birth, basically stick him in an institution and forget about him. Um, there are places for kids like this. You go have another one. Nothing wrong with you. Um, and, you know, I think, again, going back, overcoming what I did as a child, maybe was preparing me to fight for my Christopher and for kids like him. And with Chris, uh, I became this crazy fundraiser and disability advocate. Um, because on when I did, and by the way, um, I got him into the United States at 18 months of age when Vice President Hubert Humphrey became Christopher's sponsor. And that was pulling a lot of strings, a lot of people that we knew, celebrity and different people, helped us get uh, a vice president to be Chris's sponsor. But when Hubert Humphrey died, mm. was seven, we lost our sponsor. We were told to get Chris out of the country. Um, and apply to come back in. And we knew that once we took him out of the country, we'd never get him back in. So we just kept him here. And, um, yeah, and by a few... He was still, you mean when Christopher was a child up until the age of 18? Yeah, right before his, he, once he, once you, you turn 18, you're an adult. And right. no longer, it doesn't matter if you're parents fight for you and so that was always looming and we were behind the scenes I was raising a lot of money for dis a disability organization basically here in Las Vegas that my Christopher would not be able to go to because he was an illegal alien but um, I happened to be at a <laughs> I flew into Washington DC to speak at a disability conference. It was a large annual disability conference, and I was the speaker. And um, I arrived late, and I missed the entire opening plenary, and I was speaking the next day. And I forced myself to go down to the dinner. I didn't want to go. Uh, there were 1,800 people in the room. I just wanted to go to my bed and prepare for the next day's talk. Mm -hmm. And it happened on – there was one seat – uh, that I sat in that was available and 
introducing myself to people at the table and it was a terrible band and it was noisy and everybody was talking loud. And then this woman said, oh, you're the speaker tomorrow. And I said, yes, I am. And she said, don't you have a disabled child? And didn't I hear something about uh, you trying to get him legal? And I shouted across the table. I've been harboring an illegal alien in my home for, for almost 18 years. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I shouted this across the table. Now, remember, there's 1,800 people in this room, and there's only one seat that I sat at at this table. And the gentleman next to me said, uh, he had introduced himself as being a speaker the next day. That's all I knew about him, too. I thought he was a fundraiser. I didn't know what he was. But he said, what did you just say? I said, well, and I quickly told him the story and, I uh, couldn't get Chris in the country and I've been harboring an illegal alien. And he, he turned out to be the head of immigration and naturalization. Oh, my Lord. He was at a disability conference because he had married a woman uh, and they adopted an Asian child, a child from Asia, who turned out to have a disability. So he was speaking the next day. Uh, about immigration issues and people with disabilities. So he could have had me thrown out of the country. But, but I bet he helped you, didn't he? he? He did. And my Christopher became a, a legal resident of the United States on stage at the Hilton Hotel with Wayne Newton, the Everly Brothers, the Follies Bergere, and a couple of senators. <laughs> He got his American amazing, flag. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's all is, true. You can't is, make it up. <laughs> how is Christopher today? Oh, uh, so I'm sorry that I thought you knew. So Christopher passed away this past May. Oh and, my! Yeah, and I, you know, I I launched the book. It's almost like he hung in there until I launched the book. He had been ill for the last uh, couple of years, and um. He was actually supposed to come to my book launch here in Las Vegas, but he had gotten ill again. And so uh, I lost Chris in 2019, uh, and that's not in the book. I need to go back and, and add a page. I miss my little guy, my, my inspiration for everything, but I'm continuing to live the life that he carved out for me and down the path that, that he provided for me. And he gave you strength. In his own way. I mean, the, the yeah. process, what, what happened on the plane and with the alien issues and with the health mm-hmm. issues, uh, all of that gave you the strength. You, I think you had the courage, truthfully. Yeah, I learned to be a, 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 a fighter and to not give up. And I've often, my mantra always is no is not an option. But that was a, a tough fight. <laughs> it was a long, protracted fight. To, well, uh, I, I think that, you know, I, I agree with you that no is not an option because there's always a way. I always, yeah. there's always a way. Yeah. It doesn't matter, but there is always a way. And the, one of the ways is maybe you don't do it, but that, that's not no. No means, yeah. in my opinion, that you give up. Yeah. Or, you know, no is really just the beginning of a negotiation. Uh, you know, if, if, if you wrap your head around it, just don't take no. Well, I, 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 I understand, and I, I'm certainly aligned with your mantra. Uh, if I had stopped at the word no years ago when I had three young children under the age of nine, whatever, the, I had three in three years, and then I left my husband, et cetera, et cetera, but I was put in positions where I had to raise money to live, and mm-hmm. they were my motivation. My children were my motivation. Right. All As the, they are to all of us, um, absolutely. Uh, mo- some of us, things have changed. Yeah. <laughs> things have changed. But to you and me, and that's all we're you know talking about now. Our children, and specifically your your Chris, your Christopher, um, was your you know that was your beam, that was your light that kept you moving forward all these years. Well, I think children like Christopher uh, and and so many of the people that I have that I prefer to be around, you know, people with profound intellectual disabilities. That there's lessons, daily lessons. They 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 are the bravest people. <laughs> they deal with things that would bring most of us to our knees. Uh, you know, most often they have so many other issues that go along with it, and. 
you know, I, I've been involved with a lot of different disability organizations, and, and one of them that I, I really admire is Best Buddies, and they provide a, a sort of a normal mainstream child with an opportunity to have a friend with a disability. And to me, it's wonderful for the child with a disability, but I think it's more wonderful for the mainstream kid because they learn daily lessons mm-hmm. of you know, how fortunate you are to have all the choices that you have when you're born. You just, you just need to make the right ones. And, uh, and watching people with disabilities struggle with all of the things that they have to deal with that most often getting up is a, is a process. You know, it, it might take them, you know, an hour or two just to get to their program. They have to wait for that special bus to pick them up. They just can't jump in their cars like we do and take things for granted. And, and that's the benefit for me of, of being, of living in a world around folks that, um, that that just don't have all the opportunities that we have. Well, there you go, folks. This is Linda Smith. Her website is lindaslife.com and her Twitter is her Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and LinkedIn are all live Linda's life, live Linda's life. And some of you may have already been through some of the traumas that Linda has experienced. But if you want to know more about Linda Smith and her son, Christopher, and her life and the way she raised almost a billion dollars and has, is a fundraising icon within the Las Vegas community, get her book, Unwanted, How a Mother Learned to Turn Shame, Grief, and Fear into Purpose, passion and empowerment now if linda can do this so can you because linda's a person that's it she's a person she's an individual so if you have complaints if you have issues uh re re listen to this podcast and you might want to go to apple itunes and leave her a rave review oh so well i i Yes. So give us um, lasting words. What would you say to, at the end, to end this show? Oh, I think just open your heart to the possibilities. Um, the world is yours. Grab it. Run with it joyously. Um, I'm making this up as I'm, as I'm talking. It's not a mantra. Just, I, I just open your heart to everything. Let everybody in. And, and you'll find the amazing things uh, that people possess if you just give them a chance. Okay, there you go, people. Lindaslife.com. And for those of you who are looking for a couple of free things, go to my website at askjoannevictoria.com and you can get a copy of the True Self Handbook, A Guide to Transform Your Life, as well as a special report on Five Steps to Life Work Harmony. I thank you all for being here today. I thank Linda for being here today, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. Please go to AskJoanneVictoria.com to listen to more podcasts, check out Joanne's coaching programs, and get a free copy of her report, Five Steps to Achieve Life Work Harmony. That's AskJoanneVictoria.com. Take care and thanks for being here.